I want to actually, anybody want to know why I have a, a two by four up here? I'm going to tell you, this is actually a weapon in case anybody charges these things. No, it, it's uh, self-defense. No, we're going to use to explain it because we're, we're getting into the framing part of the Word of God. And I'm going to ask you to do something. I, this is not starting a new tradition, but I felt led to do it this morning. Would everyone stand up? And I want us to stand up while I read a particular verse of Scripture. Okay? So we're standing for the reading of the Word of God, if you can stand. And it's from 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15. And it's this, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day, meaning the day of judgment, will disclose it, whether it's to be, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If that work, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We pray, Lord, that it will, it will speak to us and that it will, God, change us in some way to bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. You may sit down. So what we're getting into is framework, framing, the importance of framing. Uh, we want to understand that verse. We want to understand what, what Paul is talking about. You know, what, what does it look like to build on the foundation of Jesus? You know, and, and to build a life that he's implying that actually matters. I mean, I, I don't want to just build a life that's comfortable now. I want to build a life that has impact now, and it has impact for eternity. I mean, that's what we should all want. We should, because I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think we can build a, an exceptionally blessed life here in this world that makes a difference in the eternal but we have to be intentional about it, okay? And, and we have to understand that, that, that the foundation is Jesus. We've been talking about that, the truth of the word of God, the revelation of Christ. But then the next thing you have to build is the skeleton or the framework. Because without skeletons that are strong or, or, or frames, frameworks that are strong, you, you can't build much of anything. Can you imagine what you would look like with your skeleton removed? You know, we'd all be like, you know, blobs, kind of just, you know, laying on the ground. Isn't that a gross thought? <laughs> you know, yeah, say yuck. <laughs> you know, but, but, but if you build a building with lousy lumber, you end up with something equally rotten. Years ago in Kansas City, when I was single, you know, I lived in an apartment. And just like in Denver, apartments were going up and Kansas City was growing. And builders from all over the country would come and build these massive apartment complexes. And there was one guy that showed up and he built the coolest apartments. They had great clubhouses. They had neat amenities. They had, you know, landscaping and all kinds of really wonderful things. But he used second-class materials. And it wasn't more than a year to 18 months later than everybody who rented one of these apartments began to notice that the decks began to dip. And there was a four to six inch dip. And so every deck looked like that. And I remember driving down Interstate 35 and looking across at various apartment complexes. And you knew every single one this builder built because all of them had smiley faces for decks. <laughs> And there was actually lawsuits that went on and all kinds of things. But, but that's what you get if you try to put the amenities out there without first taking care of the foundation and the framing. Okay? Now, what's he talking about when he says everybody's work is going to get tested by fire? Well, in the end, we're all going to stand before God and I, I just don't want us all standing there saying, hey, Lord, I'm here. I'm, I'm here for my reward. Look at everything I've done for you. And God looks at it and says, yeah, not so much. Uh, you're you're going to be in, but you need to go join those people who spent their entire lives playing video games. And guys and gals, some of us are going to say, well, I thought what I did mattered. Well, it, it did until we put it to the test. 
and it didn't survive the test. And so when you think about what tests look like, I want you to watch a short video that I, I, I stole from the internet about the difference between flame-proof and non-flame-proof building materials. Roll tape. We're here at Wayne County Regional Training Facility. We're conducting tests with four sets, identically built framing, uh, showing different cladding materials, cedar, vinyl, engineered wood, and then finally party fiber cement. We want to show the differences between combustible and non-combustible cladding materials and how it can be impacting on a house. The wall structures are the same, the ignition is the same, we held the flame to the wall for the same amount of time. The only thing that's different is the exterior product. All cameras rolling, ready to go. Five, four, three, two, one. Got the on, go. And it's already coming out the sides too. We have smoke coming out the side. Now, right at the top, we got flame coming through. That's amazing. Very impressed with the hardy fiber cement. There was zero flame impingement into the interior of the structure. We think it's important to show that there is a difference in the materials so that we can inform and educate homeowners and contractors on the choices they can make with regards to what they choose to install in their homes. I'm gonna reside my house pretty soon. I've made up my mind. So the first thing I wanna say is James Hardy did not pay for this advertisement. <laughs> All right. But if you had to pick siding for your house, which one are you picking? I'm picking, I'm picking the flame resistant. And, and that's the thing. You have a choice. I have a choice. Everybody in this room has a choice on how we want to frame our life or what kind of skeleton we want to give our lives. We can give it flame resistant skeletons or we can pick something that isn't quite as durable and certainly doesn't have the internet internal the eternal impact. And, and so this is a thing I want you to remember. What determines a building or person's survivability isn't the tests they are exposed to. We're all going to be exposed to the same test. It's not the tests. It's the materials their frameworks are made from. That's the thing I want us to remember. So having said that, then how do we take a look at our lives and say, okay, I know I'm doing okay here, maybe not so good here. You know, how do we, how do we sort of self-evaluate, as it were? Well, there's three questions I want to share with you this morning. And, and the first is this. You know, are, are we trying to get by with substandard building materials? Instead of top-grade lumber, are, are we using cheap scrap? Did, did, did we found some burn pile behind somebody's house, and we pulled some junk out, and that's what we're really... And I'm being metaphorical. You know what I'm saying? Instead of building our lives on, on, on some really good things, things like we, we've talked about these last few weeks, you, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just junk. It may even look good, but it won't last when you put the flame to it. Actually, I wanted to bring flame up here today, and Steve Pennington told me that I can't. Something about fire codes and penalties, and so, Steve, it'd have been so cool to have like a, one of those giant things, wouldn't it? I mean, I, you know, but I, maybe next time. I don't know. It's, I, I, I want to give you a couple of verses from the book of Proverbs that, that you can use to self-diagnose the, the quality of your skeleton, the quality of your framework. And the first is this. And it's Proverbs 14, 30. A heart of peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. <laughs> Anybody ever felt envious of somebody else? Looked across the fence and said, dang, his grass is green. You know, looked at their car, wanted their car. I shared with the pastors last week that, that I, I, had a, I, have, I had an incident the last few weeks about envy. I'd been in contact with some of the, there's four or five guys from my college that I'm still tight with. And they are all rich. <laughs> all of them, that's snotty, noxious, born again, evil human beings. You know, and, 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 and I'm not broke by any stretch of the imagination, but I ain't got what they got. 
And, and, and I was just thinking about it. You know, Lord, I left, you know, engineering to pursue you. And this one's got a 50-foot travel trailer, and he goes all over the country. And that one just bought a second house in Florida. And, and that one over there, you know, and I'm just kind of comparing myself amongst myself with my peers, which is unwise. And, and the point of that is, is that is toxic to my bones. That's toxic to my framework. And if you find yourself inadequate in your own eyes because you looked at somebody else, you are literally just destroying yourself. And God can't build on envy. Second proverb is similar. It's Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. I am intimately aware that, that mental health and depression, and these are things that are real, and they exist in the church, and they need to be dealt with and not covered up. But that's what I'm saying. Are we dealing with the, the anxieties, the fears, the, 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 the depression, the discouragements that are in our lives? Because all of those exist because we don't have a revelation of God's love and faithfulness. And that's not a condemnation, that's a diagnosis. So the question is, how do we go about walking in the reality that God loves me just as I am? He accepts me just as I am. You know, he wants good things for me because he loves me, not because I earn those things. He wants to help me live a blessed life both in this world and in the world to come. He wants me to get to the gates of heaven and have my life exposed to the flames of judgment. And, and what remains is, you know, hey... Enter into your reward, my good and faithful servant. That's what God wants for us. But in order for that to happen, i got to start realizing that I can't let poison into my soul and I can't destroy my bones. Okay? So where does a cheerful heart come from? It comes from the revelation of God. And if we're dealing with some stuff, well, you, I, I know it can be difficult, but there is a breakthrough. And this may be the ignition of a new day in your life. This may be the start of something significant that you come to a place saying, I'm going to deal with this, and I'm not going to pretend about it anymore. I'm going to actually own it and say, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to get help. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go forward because I've got some bones that are dried up, all right? So that's the first question. The second question is, if I'm trying to, to not only identify the bad framework, if I'm trying to not only identify the bad wood, what, what's the good word, wood look like? What do good bones look like? Well, God tells us, and, he, and he, interestingly enough, uh, he tells us in, in the, the word of God, Proverbs 24.3, by wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. Wisdom and understanding. They're two different things. You need both. They're a match set. You can't have one without the other. It won't do you any good. What is wisdom? Wisdom is, I'll give you a couple of different definitions. Wisdom is knowing what to do. Understanding is knowing when and where to do it. Okay. It, 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 you, again, if you know what to do to, to fix your life or to have a better life, but you don't know when and where to apply those truths, it doesn't do you any good. And, and you can think of it this way. W wisdom is understanding is the diagnosis. So I, can, I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to, they, they look at me and they say, well, you know, I know that this is what the problem is in my life, and yet they don't have the wisdom to know how to make the changes to be able to walk in the victory that God wants them to have. They've identified the problem, but they don't know the solution. And likewise, I know people who can spout the word of God. They go, they go this, and they go that, and they go all that stuff, and yet they have no clue how to actually apply it to relationships or to their workplace, or to, to, to conversations even. Has anybody ever said something stupid that was true? It was stupid because of who you said it to and when you said it? That, that is a lack of understanding. You got the wisdom, but you didn't get the understanding. And, and you need both. They're, they're, a, they're a match set. Because when we have wisdom and understanding, we are building a framework which can support the life that God wants us to have. Amen? Amen. Amen. I mean, it, and it's, 
It, it makes sense. Doesn't it make sense, Pat? It seems logical, but, but for whatever reason, we, we struggle with that. And, and part of the problem of struggling with that has to do with the people we hang out with. I'm just going to say, this. there is this, again, we're spending a lot of time in Proverbs today, but Proverbs 13, 20 says this, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. <laughs> I have great friends. Not all of my friends are wise. <laughs> Not all of them are like John Patrick Mahoney, who calls me up and says, hey, man, we need to pray about tomorrow's service. Hey, can you meet me over the church? And Okay, Pat, I, Pat's wise. You know, Pat's somebody who brings wisdom to my life. I've, you know, I share things with Pat, and he looks at me and goes, that's stupid. <laughs> and, and, and I, I, but I, I believe him because he knows what he's talking about, all right? I have other friends I care about. If I share the same situation with them, they're going to give me some of the dumbest advice I could possibly embrace because there's a difference between godly wisdom and carnal wisdom. And it's not that my friends are trying to hurt me. They just don't have a revelation of godly wisdom. And if you want to live a wise life, you better have a cadre. You better have a core. You better have some people who know what they're talking about based on God's truth and on the revelation of the Spirit. Now, does that mean you shouldn't have other friends? No, you should have other friends. There's people I care about deeply that don't believe in God at all. But they're my friends. Some of them are my family members. You know, none of them are pastors, thank God. It's, you know, you, but you know what I'm saying. The question is, if, if you're struggling to have revelation of both wisdom and understanding, it may be the community that you're associating with exclusively. The question is, you know, you don't go to, I mean, I, as an engineer, you don't go to a civil engineer for an electrical engineering problem. Did that make sense? It's not that the civil engineer is an idiot. He's not. He just doesn't have the revelation of electrical engineering. You want to go to somebody that knows something about what they're talking about. And if we're having struggle making good decisions, and you know how you're having struggle? If the decisions that you're making are not producing a blessing, you're making wrong decisions. <laughs> Smile at me. And, and we all do it. Come on, we all do it. I want to make good decisions, though. So I want to get people like Pat around me. I want to get small people. That's one of the reasons we encourage small groups. Right? We talk about the women's group and the men's group and our, our Bible studies and those things. It gives you a chance to, to break down barriers and actually ask questions. You know, I, I, I had a wonderful conversation this week with several believers that, that are just kind of wrestling with some deep stuff. And I remember going, huh, that's a really good question. I'm going to have to think about that before I answer it. Because, you know, some of it's good. So that's the second question. Do you have a revelation of, of, of what good framing looks like and the materials that go into it, you know, the flame-proof materials? And so first question I asked was, are you willing to look at yourself to understand why, why you're not seeing the success you think or you're not seeing the eternal success? And we come then to, to the last question this morning. If my framework has issues, and can we pause a moment? Everybody's framework has issues, <laughs> Okay. There's nobody listening to this message that doesn't need improvement in your framing, all right? Well, it's just because we're human. It comes with the package, all right? But if you want to really improve, how do you do that? It's a good question. Well, the first is I have to ask God for wisdom and understanding. You know, Pat, I loved what you did in the transition, asking God for the Holy Spirit. And I was sitting there going, you know, I heard it in one ear, but then God said, dude, you need more of the Spirit, Reese. You need more of the Spirit. And so I began to just sit on that front row and begin to ask God for more of the Spirit because I need more of the Spirit. And the same is true of wisdom. James famously wrote this in James 2, or James 1, verses 5 through 8. He said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Just pause for a second. God does not want you stupid. Now, I don't mean to offend anybody, uh, because, well, I'm not stupid. That's a terrible word. Have, you, have, you, have your kids told you they can't use that word in school yet? Have you heard that? 
We don't use that word. That's a bad word. Okay. <laughs> However, I know what stupid looks like. Sometimes I see it in the mirror in the morning. I, I, you know, so there are days that you just have to call what it was. Well, that was a dumb move, Reese. That, didn't, didn't, that one didn't work out. You should not have done that. That was stupid, okay? It doesn't mean I'm stupid. I made a stupid decision. And God doesn't want me making dumb decisions. He wants me making godly decisions. He wants me to make decisions based on wisdom and understanding. And if I'm making bad decisions, it's because I don't have wisdom and understanding. So ask, and he'll give me generously. But let him ask in faith, not doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. (laughs) And the, the implication there is there's a maturity that comes on us. It says, you know, God, give me wisdom. And then we recognize the answer. And we actually do it. And if we if we go, God, give me wisdom, is that you? Oh, that doesn't sound like you. I don't know if I like that. And, and that person is double-minded. When you ask God, God, how do I structure my finances? And he says, well, you start by the tithe, and then you get into you know, stewardship, and then you, you know, spend less than you make, and you begin to sow for you know, long term. So I got to give up like uh, all this stuff that I like? Oh, yeah, but you can replace it with other stuff, and eventually you'll have enough money that you can do that. I don't want to structure my life that way. Well, that man's double-minded and doesn't really want to prosper according to God's way. I mean, I'm just being honest. It doesn't work. You get in a relationship. God says, forgive the one who offended you. Why? They did it. I know they did it. But you need to forgive them. I, you know, I had a conversation with somebody last week. He said, they don't deserve forgiveness. In fact, I'm not ever going to forgive them because that's, and I'm just going, that's stupid. That's exactly what I said to him. I go, that's stupid. And they go, well, that's a terrible thing to say to me. What do you want me to say to you? I'm I'm just giving you some pastoral advice. That's a dumb decision. That's not going to do anybody any good, most importantly you. If you want to forgive them, that will actually help you. You can build on that. That's good framing, okay? Because it's based on the word of God. But if you want to be double-minded and say, well, I don't care if it's the word of God or not. I'm not doing it. You're not going to see stability in the relationships, in your marriages, in your friendships. Again, this is good stuff, right? But no one is smiling. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> uh, I mean, not that I have to, you have to laugh, but it's like, oh, there's something in this that will actually help me. I'm trying to help you. This is, you know, uh, it's kind of like those unpleasant, you know, procedures you get at the doctor. It may not be fun for the moment, but eventually it works out okay, all right? I don't know how I got on that today. You just help me, Okay. <laughs> And and then we also have to understand the practical side of faith. But someone will say, ah, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Wisdom and understanding come with implementation plans. Okay? God doesn't give you some deep revelation of his love and say, okay, walk in the revelation of his love, but don't actually apply it to yourself or anybody else. He says, okay, this is how you actually love somebody. Huh. There's implementation to it. God doesn't bring you a revelation of how you can prosper financially without showing you how to spend your money. God doesn't tell you how to have good conversations with somebody that you care about, your spouse, your girlfriend, your father, your mother, your kids, without telling you how to change your words. Okay? There is always a practical side to the supernatural of things that we can put into practice. And as we think about what what Paul was writing to the Corinthians, and we we begin to say, you know, I I, I, want to build a life that is flame-proof, that when I stand before God, he looks at it and says, man, that is something else. You followed my blueprints. Okay, you know what I'm saying? You followed my blueprints. This is, this is what I mean. I, I, I showed you the plans, and you followed them. And look what you were able to accomplish, both in your life on earth and, and the reward that you have earned in heaven. 
I, I know we don't talk about the fact that we're all eternal beings and that there is a heaven that's coming to all of us, that, that, that it does matter how we live now for how we live then, but that is true. And it's not a horrible thing. It's an, it's an opportunity. It's an, it's an invitation. God says he prepares a table in the presence of our enemies that we may come and dine and eat and thrive. But the invitation requires us to be obedient. Otherwise, we're going to end up in heaven basically naked. As, you know, that's kind of the other implication. That sounds awful, doesn't it, to stand before God with nothing but your boxer shorts? And he just says, okay, go sit down someplace. <laughs> I was looking for a cheap laugh, guys. It didn't go over very well. And so that brings us to the end. And uh, what do we do with this? Well, it's the first of a several-week series. But, but the question is, are we willing to let God ignite a flame in us that will change us this morning? That that flame, rather than consume us, will temper us and make us flame proof. For each of us, that's, that's our own individual decision. By the way, I was bragging on worship this morning. It was, I had an amazing time with God right there. It really was just really good. So, so Father, I, I come to you as, as the giver of the message this morning. I shared the word that you gave me. And I share it, Father, not out of uh, any motive other than to, to initiate something this morning. As Pat said last night, we need to pray for the service today. That we want to initiate something in my heart. And I, I just, I want to, I want to capture what you spoke to me on that front row. And I want to own it. And I want to be able to, to do something with it. But I want everybody else to have a similar moment. And if they haven't yet, God, then whether they're online or in person, Holy Spirit, spark something, light something, ignite something in them. Pose a question to them that they're going to have to chew on and actually think about. Bring up a scripture that maybe they've forgotten or haven't thought about in a while that, that you want them to, to walk in a fresh revelation of that, that passage this morning. Maybe there's a person, God, that you want to initiate a, a reconciliation in their life between them and that person. Or maybe there's something new you want to do. Maybe there's a revelation, God, that you know something? You've been wasting your time trying to build something that's just never going to last. It's just going to burn up when it's tested. And we can walk away from that, God, because there's always something better. There's always something better. There's always something better. Holy Spirit, do your work. Do what I can't do. Do the supernatural. As we were praying, I'm just going to share the image that I got, and you take it or don't take it. I got an image of an angry grizzly. And, and I was like, well, God, that's a terrifying thing to have to face. And, and, and God said, no, it's not, if you're walking in faith in me. And I feel like he's saying that there's some people, you've been terrified of some things that are they're real. They're real circumstances, they're real situations. But they, they shouldn't terrify you. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So, yeah. It's got teeth, it's got claws, it's got bad breath, it's got all that stuff. But you stay in faith and you tell it to be silent and sit down. Because it will obey the word of God. Because it hasn't got a choice. You have a choice. It doesn't. You speak the word of God over that situation and it will come into conformance with what God's will is. And that's my word. Father, bless everyone here. If anyone does not know Christ, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to reach out and say, God, forgive me of my sins. I, I want the cleansing. I want the cleansing of Christ. I want, I want to be forgiven. 
And I want the righteousness of God, that real righteousness, the true righteousness, the eternal righteousness. And, and so fill me with your spirit and draw me into your family and help me to repent and walk free and change this morning going forward for the rest of my life. Whether you're online or, or here, if you will pray that prayer, just say, God, I believe and forgive me and help me to change and help me to become a follower, a disciple of you. Your life will never be the same. And that's my prayer. Amen.